we have two alternatives, and they're both flawed, really deeply flawed, not just like a few superficial mistakes, but both of them are capable of the most incredible, vile, ugly stuff. The Tikva Fund and Mosaic Magazine present Nationalism and the Future of Western Freedom, a lecture based on the Mosaic article of the same title by Yoram Hazoni. In this episode, distinguished writer and strategist Walter Russell Mead responds to Yoram Hazoni's analysis and argument. Walter Russell Mead is a professor of foreign affairs and humanities at Bard College and a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. Previously, he was a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. He's the author of Special Providence, God and Gold, Power, Terror, Peace, and War, and his forthcoming book is called The Ark of a Covenant, The United States, Israel, and the Fate of the Jewish People. Well, I guess I, you know, tonight is sort of a night maybe for stereotyping in that uh, the sort of young firebrand intellectual gives a great message and then this sort of doddering old fogey says, well, it's a little more confused and complicated. But that's, you know, hey, that's the way it works. And uh, I say, you actually have much more fun. I can remember being the young firebrand and it's great. Uh, and being the old fogey is sort of a bore. Uh, but let me just, let me try to complicate the picture. This is what I'm always telling my students. I'm going to try to complicate your life a little bit. They build this great Tower of Babel, and they want to build a tower that reaches heaven. And that looks on the one hand like, you know, how noble you want to get up to heaven. What, what could be a more am appropriate ambition for a human civilization? On the other hand, it's a challenge to the majesty of God. You want to, you want to take for yourself something that really by right only belongs to the creator, to the transcendent. So with the universal pre-Babel civilization was flawed. But it's interesting too, you really, you know, uh, you, re you read that account, and it's not that God was so pleased with their building this tower to the heaven that as a reward, he divided them into different countries. It's actually as a punishment and as a preventive measure. And what it suggests to me is actually, as is often the case in human affairs, I might even go so far as to say it's usually the case in human affairs, we have two alternatives, and they're both flawed, really deeply flawed, not just like a few superficial mistakes, but both of them are capable of the most incredible, vile, ugly stuff. And that's true absolutely of cosmopolitan universalism that basically gets you to the point where the king is saying, anybody who doesn't pray to the idol that I've just erected, you know, is going to be executed. Uh, that happens. It's happened more than once in human history, and there are a lot of people out there who'd like to make it happen again. Absolutely the case. But on the other hand, you know, we, if we look at the map of Europe in 1870 or so, what we see, particularly Eastern and Central Europe, we see f basically four big states. Ottoman Empire, Austrian Empire, at least after 1870, the German Empire and the Russian Empire. F 100 years later, we see 40 or 50 states and oh, 100 million plus people have died, and another 30 million people have been driven from their homes. And at the end, we have nice, democratic, nationalist, ethnic nation states. But there are a lot of problems with the nation. It's not, we cannot oppose nationalism as a good and cosmopolitanism as a bad. Um, one of the problems with nations, I mean, it came up actually in your talk, is you were congratulating the nation of Britain on independence. Britain isn't a nation. 
It's a cosmopolitan civilization. Ask the Scots. It's not actually the independence of a nation. It's the secession of one multinational state from a larger multinational entity. It may yet lead to Scottish independence, an event that's very unlikely, by the way, to be good for the Jews of Scotland. The SNP is not a particularly philo-Semitic organization. Nor, may I point out, were all these other national... When I think of the, the, the renewed spirit of nationalism and ethnic roots in Europe, I think of the beautiful example of Hungary and the great love for the Jewish people that the Hungarian nationalists are constantly expressing. Or I think of great you know, proponents of national unity and strength of the past glorious years of, of uh, European history. I think, for example, of that magnificent czar, Alexander III, whose concern to create a nationalist Russia that was deeply rooted in the character and the language and the culture of the Russian people meant, of course, we couldn't have all these Jews going to universities and living in the wrong places. So, it's na nationalism is not an answer to the human condition, it seems to me, any more than cosmopolitanism is. Both of them have important capacities. Both of them are subject to terrible temptations. And so the question, it seems to me, of politics and statecraft is, you know, how, what in, in a particular situation, in a particular circumstance, at a particular time, What's the right blend? You know, I don't just have friends who are pro-Trump. I got a ton of relatives who are pro-Trump. <laughs> I will say, again, there's not a high association in my experience with philo-Semitism and philo-Trumpism. I don't say it's all that way. But basically, if there's an anti-Semitic troll on my tri uh, Twitter feed, I can have a pretty good guess at who that person is supporting for president. So, again, nationalism is not the answer in a simple way or a simplistic way to the problem that liberal cosmopolitanism poses for those of us who actually do believe that there is something other than a kind of Lockean social contract that, uh, that, that should hold people together and guide our lives. And so, you know, part of the problem, I think, is that actually, very often in the past and today, nations try to do the same thing on a small scale that cosmopolitan empires do on a large scale. So we're going to have a Hungarian nation. That Hungarian nation within the boundary of Hungary is going to have cultural unity, is going to stand for Hungarian principles, Hungarian ideas, and by the way, making sure that Hungarians, and you know who isn't Hungarian really, are getting the good jobs and are making the policy and are conducting our intellectual debate. And so what the medieval popes and emperors wanted to see in the kind of Christian Republic of Europe you'll find that very often nationalists want to achieve that same kind of homogeneity, uniformity, uh, a kind of a t holistic total social construction within the boundaries of a nation or among the members of a nation state. Now having said that, I would not want to exclude, and I, you, know, you do a terrific job and a courageous job at a time when it's unfashionable to speak to these things, to talk about, yes, there is a true positive ethical content to nationalism. You know, so that in the 1840s, the rich Czech burghers living in, you know, nice houses in Prague would be made to feel guilty because what about the poor Czech peasant out there who is unenlightened, uneducated, receives no sort of help in their life? Your brothers. 
you need to work with them and be with them and care for them. And you, if you look at the history of nationalism, not just in one European country, but in many, nationalism becomes a form in which solidarity is extended beyond the immediate family to a larger group of people. So nationalism has an ethical value. I think in the liberal tradition, the Anglo-American liberal tradition, which is very much where I'm kind of intellectually at home, I think the person who speaks to this best is Burke, who, you know, though Irish and, and operating in an English setting, was very, and perhaps because of this, was very aware both of the importance of the sort of depth and cultural roots and the need for a, 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 a political society to grow as far as possible organically out of its own past, but also for Burke. The purpose of political action is not to freeze a desirable status quo and hold it forever. Burke would frequently make the argument that if you want things to get better, you know, festina lente, make haste slowly. If you go too fast and get ahead of yourself as you try to incorporate more universal and cosmopolitan values into the political institutions and structures of your life, if you go too fast, you'll lose your political balance, your society will begin to fall apart. So, you know, in, in that sense, for Burke, the idea to travel hopefully is better than to arrive, to, um, to sort of move from the standpoint of a traditional society which is gradually incorporating elements of tolerance and diversity without losing touch with those roots that create your identity and nurture your identity. To me, that seems to be a useful way to think about it, but again, it's very complicated. Now, I should probably say experientially I come from this. I come from a political society which you know, had, a, had a vote and voted for independence and declared and proclaimed its independence. And I'm speaking, of course, of the sovereign state of South Carolina. And it denounced, and you can go back and read what these famous statesmen said, as they denounced the forces of liberalism, quite literally, that was destroying the traditional roots of South Carolina. Um, and of course, uh, we weren't alone in that experiment that we did. Um, so I would argue very strongly that we cannot look either to nationalist particularism or to cosmopolitan universalism as the sort of answer to the, to the human condition. And that I would also argue that the tension one often sees in the Jewish community, if I can speak as a, I hope, a friendly outsider here, between people who understand their sort of Jewish calling in terms of loyalty to universal ethical norms versus those who s feel their calling as Jews more to the preservation and the cultivation of communal identity and, of course, Zionist identity, that this tension within the Jewish community, the Jewish family, is not a way in which the Jewish family is sort of betraying its calling as, as, a, as a people that are to be a light to the world. This is actually an aspect of that in which Jews are living out this human condition of having two alternatives, neither of which really works, and yet among which we have to live. So I, um, you know, I think you actually did a terrific job of exposing the difficulties that follow when we try to, when, you know, to, to, try to bring the, the idea of ethics into politics at all, you are introducing universal and cosmopolitan ideas. But human societies that only have those kinds of ideas are weak. And here, I guess this is the last point of complication I want to introduce. And that is, I think you are maybe overstating the strength of liberalism. It was actually remarkable how quickly everyone in Britain you know, got over Brexit in the sense you now have 
a very unruffled Theresa May presiding in a, in a quite exemplary fashion over a Tory cabinet. Mr. Juncker has given his State of the European Union address, things are moving on. You know, this was not actually, it, you know, it's sort of certainly a much less profound disruption than the election of a President Trump would be, uh, good or bad. And actually, again, I don't, I think that we're seeing in Europe, regardless of what Britain does or doesn't do, the f laws of political gravity are reasserting themselves. Because in fact, it's not simply that that as that human societies, that one of these two alternatives is good and the other is evil, it's actually neither is really sustainable. That hu human nature needs both a universal ethical component and a rooted component. And if political leaders try to steer off too hard in one direction or the cultural movement of, of one particular moment in time, moves too far off, the pendulum swings. So we, we see 50 years of determined European cultivation of a European identity in a super state, and now we see a massive continental reaction. So I think, again, I think we're, we're, we're looking at pendulum swinging. I am hoping at any rate that uh, uh, the, the king is not going to put up a, uh, an idol and demand that we all worship it in the universal empire. I hope if that happens, I, I have the courage to stand with Daniel and uh, say, as for me, I will serve the Lord. Um, but this is, I, I don't think we're quite going to be tested that way right away. Although, I, I do give trigger warnings, I should tell you, to my classes at the beginning of every semester. I say, I'm teaching you a class of history. This is basically going to be the story of lots of people doing bad things to other people. And very, very often, the people who do bad things end up being much richer than the people <laughs> to whom bad things are done. So if, if you're not comfortable with this, then you probably are in the wrong room. Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah. It's really good. The goal should be to divide the Middle East, to redraw the borders according to national and religious boundaries. This is exactly what Woodrow Wilson said in 1918. But they didn't do that. They because did. The, they couldn't. They no, the they no, couldn't. no, they because the French and the British wanted multinational states where they could more easily rule. And there would be no opposition, you think, today to this proposal from great powers that saw their interests being in some way damaged by it? <laughs> he, he gave me unlimited power in the question.